Welcome to the Configure It Done podcast. The Configure It Done podcast is a place where successful thought leaders in the SAP space come to share their leadership styles, their tips, and their unique stories on how to run successful large-scale SAP programs. Listen to the podcast to learn from their successes, their failures, their career stories, and their inspirations. This podcast is in partnership with the Black Dog Institute, who aim to create a mentally healthier world for everyone. If you wish to support the cause, please donate via the link below. So today on the podcast, we've got Pierre Francis Grillet. Did I say that right? I hope so. <laughs> um, he, he works for Software One. What's your current role, Pierre? Um, I have I have a few, but uh, the the first one is the uh, global director for SAP Business Development, and I'm also acting as the regional VP for Asia Pacific for the SAP Business Line. Where are you coming from live today? And I'm coming live from sunny Sunnyvale in California at the Google Cloud headquarter. Lovely, very exciting. Slightly different than rainy Sydney. Yeah, where are you normally based? Is is it Sydney? So I'm normally based in Sydney. I've uh, I've enjoyed a bit of traveling uh, since November when the border finally opened in Australia. So um, as part of the global role, I engage with the uh, the teams we have in um, in in many countries. Software One is in uh, 90 countries. Uh, we uh, run SAP out of uh, uh, 25 of those, and so uh, as part of my roles, I get to uh, to meet customers and and help the local teams. Okay. Um, I should say who I am because I'm not normally on here. Yes, you should. So yes, I'm I'm Simon Hare and Jay Winter, Mr. SAP is normally doing this, but he is uh, overseas in the UK having a well-deserved holiday. So I'm I'm standing in. All right. Okay. Uh, should we get started? Yeah. All right. Definitely. I will ask the first question then. We've got like this quick fire thing and we will start with, yeah. What is your full name, Pierre? So... My full name is Pierre Francis Antoine Grillet. Right, okay. That is the full name. Lovely. <laughs> and what's your nickname? PF. Now, as you obviously recognize with a long name like mine, I just feel empathy for people. And I said, I'm going to put them out of their misery trying to guess what is my complex double hyphenated French first name. And so PF works well for everyone. And where are you from? So I was born in Paris, in France, and grew up in Lyon. Um, that's where I spent then most of my career when I was in Europe. And how long have you been in Australia? I left France the day after the 1998 Soccer World Cup, um, <laughs> which was the first win of France, and landed in Australia on Bastille Day 1998. So that's uh, 24 years and counting. Okay. Asking in the glory. You're not allowed to say your current place of work, because that would be unfair, but where's the best, like, what's the best job you've ever had? Um, that's, that's a really interesting question. I think um, I really enjoy what I'm doing now. And uh, when I reflect on all the roles I've had in the past, uh, there are always highs and lows in any role. Uh, but what's most important is when you get to tackle new challenges and you start to make wins, uh, that's when you really feel elated and when the, the motivation really kicks in and you have the adrenaline of having been successful in tackling these new difficult things. So um, I've, I think I was fortunate to uh, to have really highs in, in most of the roles that I've had in the past in uh, and, and mostly thanks to SAP, I have to say. Yeah, interesting. OK, and so what's the worst job? Um, the worst job, without any doubt, is uh, when I was a student to uh, finance my studies, I, I was acting as a security agent in an oil refinery in the south of Lyon. And uh, I was working in shifts, and the worst one was the one from midnight to eight o'clock. Uh, so you had to uh, stay awake until midnight. And I was uh, I was manning the, the switchboard, and there was always a call at 2 or 3 a.m. by the supervisor making sure that I wasn't asleep. So that was a pretty long night, fairly boring. There was not much activity during the night. So, Did the call wake you up? <laughs> um, I didn't get caught, so <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Nice. Um, what's your favorite sport? So practicing, it's uh, absolutely ocean swimming. And in Sydney, I'm definitely in the right place. Uh, watching, I, I love watching Formula One. Yeah, OK. 
And um, where do you live in Sydney then if you're an ocean swimmer? I'm guessing it's near one of the beaches. Yeah, not too far. I actually live in Killarney Heights. Uh, as uh, the listeners will pick up, I do have a very strong French accent. Uh, and so there is a primary bilingual primary school in Killarney Heights where we uh, we put our two boys. And so that's where we are. That's where we based. I'm guessing the swim that you do, the bold and beautiful and manly, I'm guessing. You're guessing absolutely right. Yeah, that's right. All right. Have you done that one? I did that one, yeah. yeah. You guys should catch up for a beer afterwards. This leads in nicely. What's your favourite beer? Pass. Oh, sorry. You know, I'm coming from France and uh, my grandfather was a wine reseller. So I wasn't really born into a beer culture. So I have a lot of favourite wines. Um, I I do enjoy the occasional beer, but I, I, I don't really have a, uh, a real preference there. It's a uh, favourite wine then? Um, I really enjoyed some of the uh, typical um, white French wines, which are fairly different from what we find in, in Australia. And I would say especially the uh, the white Burgundy, they have some really nice, uh, not too sweet Chablis, and also the white uh, Côte d'Or, which is used in, in church by the by the, the priest in France, and they know they, they know their wine. That's pretty good. <laughs> they know their stuff. As a Frenchman, I'm really interested in your answer to this. And so your favourite meal, you know, you, you kind of, you got to choose your last meal, your favourite meal. Uh, look, um, I think food experience is also about discovery. And so you have to be open to eat new things uh, and, and try to, you know, always try new things. I enjoy cooking as well occasionally. And one of my favourite dishes that I cook is an eggplant gratin. Uh, and that's that's a favourite of, of uh my children, they want to learn how to cook it, so I, I take that as a as a good success. Nice. Are you a vegetarian? Uh, I'm not vegetarian, but I do enjoy vegetables. <laughs> Same, to be fair. Um, how do you keep yourself sane? Uh, well, particularly uh, in, in the last uh, 24 months, uh, I think exercise is quite important. It's a, it's a place of reflection. Um, so I enjoy running. I, I do that normally early in the morning. That helps putting my thoughts together and uh, and get ready for the day, getting in a positive mood. And uh, as I said, I enjoy ocean swimming. For me, I had a real weekend when I had a swim and I sort of washed away all the nasty stuff that happened during the weekend and get ready to restart. Yeah, there's something about coming out of the ocean. Something happens when you finish a swim, especially that swim where you just feel alive. Eh? Um, and I don't know what it is. It's magical, especially when you swim on a cold Sunday morning in winter yeah. and you and you think at first, what the hell am I doing there? It's so yeah. cold, I'd be better in my bed. And then at the end of the swim, you feel so great yeah. that, uh, you know, it was absolutely worth it. It's a different feeling to a run or a bike ride or a, or a gym session, definitely. Yeah. Um, how would you describe your leadership style in one word? Um, pride in what you do. And what's your favorite music and film? Um, it, it's I, I actually combine them. Uh, Le Grand Bleu, because I love swimming, and Le Grand Bleu was really uh, something that I really resonated with, both on the music and on the movie itself. So the big blue, I think it's probably known for Australians' audience. Okay. And your favorite holiday destination? Uh, I enjoy going back to France, obviously, being located in Australia, but I have to say Italy is probably the place that I love the most. Okay. Because of the wine? Um, I think it's the culture, it's the, uh, it's the atmosphere, it's just the, it's the beauty of, the, uh, of, of this country. Really? Yeah. Coming from a Frenchman, wow. Yeah. Such a beautiful country. Which part of Italy do you prefer? Uh, particularly Tuscany and uh, and particularly Firenze, Florence. I love this city. Yeah. Yeah, it's gorgeous, isn't it? Um, mm. And what's your bucket list thing to do then? Um, mostly traveling. There's still many places in the world that uh, curiously I still haven't seen. Uh, and so uh, I wish to visit more of Australia, the Kimberleys, as doing some nice dive in uh, Ningalo Reef. That's part of my bucket list. Antarctica, Vietnam, I haven't done. So still plenty of places, um, probably Tibet as well. So, so so many nice places in the world. So I think Ningaloo Reef, that's the place where you can swim with the whale sharks. Yeah, they come through there. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. And if you weren't an SAP, 
what would you be doing, do you think? Um, look, I, I did test a few things completely different from SAP, but realistically, I would most likely be in a role um, supporting or driving transformation using technology. I think that's that's something that is really a, a place that fascinates me by the pace of um, technology, but by what it enables and uh, and the uh, the contribution you can make in uh, in joining the two together. So using technology to deliver significant outcomes that helps businesses, helps people, etc. You wouldn't have stayed in the security field. <laughs> no, probably not. That. No, <laughs> fair enough. Um, give us a fun fact about yourself then. Um, a fun fact that will resonate with some recent events. Um, I I have a PhD in nuclear chemistry and, and I'm a nuclear engineer by training. I have a master degree in nuclear engineering and during my military service, I was working on nuclear submarine and of course French nuclear submarines um, <laughs> and doing some testing in security, etc. I think in the in, in that's that's a fun fact considering what happened recently in Australia with the choice of uh, of of defense equipment. Yeah, definitely. And I, I noticed that on your on your profile, yeah, that you you're a doctor in um yeah, chemistry, biochemistry in nuclear chemistry. Yeah. 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 Probably the most intelligent person I've ever met. Um, uh, you, you know, don't get fooled by titles and there are many ways to measure intelligence as well. So, OK, um, so let's get started into the main part of the podcast around how you got into SAP and your story and background. I'd love to hear how you've ended up also studying a doctorate in yeah, nuclear technology as well. Nuclear chemistry. That's amazing. It's so the uh, the nuclear side of things. Um, I studied in the uh, in the um, uh, late 70s and and early 80s, uh, and so the nuclear program was in full swing in France, uh, and that was just an amazing space because all the latest technology were actually um, uh, at play in in the nuclear program, and the, the nuclear element is actually one of the easiest and most commonly understood part of the program. And there are some other element of, of really complex realization, uh, the science of metal in particular, uh, and, and other elements. And they all put at play in the nuclear program from anti-seismic to uh, thermodynamics to, um, to obviously anything to do with nuclear, but also a large part of IT and safety. Uh, in order to predict uh, and prevent incidents, even change management to sort of uh, uh, influence people's behaviors and to create the right reaction to the right events. So as a student, it was a fascinating space um, to be and to learn and to uh, to being able to see the uh, the French nuclear program from the civil engineering status to, uh, to uh, the full operation. So it was a very exciting place, but it was um, well advanced and it was already transitioning from research and development and design into just operations. And so in terms of job opportunities, I came towards the tail of it. And so it was easy to see that um, it would be difficult to make a career in there. And so I also came from a very technology background uh, through my engineering studies and degrees. And I felt that there was something missing. I didn't have the uh, the time and the money to afford an MBA, so I joined uh, Anderson Consulting, and uh, and basically learned what I didn't know in terms of business and economics and and the um, the, the way that business operates uh, in business consulting. So that's what brought me, uh, in fact, to SAP. Um, I spent nearly 10 years with um, Anderson Consulting, now known as Accenture, and they had their own ERP solution. So I basically came into SAP through the journey of uh, of ERP, implementing the uh, the uh, Accenture solution. Um, and, and after that, I moved into um, a group CIO 
uh, with global responsibility and had to select a software. So my career with SAP was not really a functional consultant or a developer, but actually the person selecting the software and then rolling this out worldwide. Uh, so I established a center of expertise. We built a template and we started to roll the solution from Mexico to Russia to Turkey and all over Europe. So that's that's how I started my SAP journey. And uh, at the end, so that was between 94 to 98. And so when people put a, a stamp into the start of the SAP journey, for me, that was R3 2.2D. So that's uh, sort of a lo long time ago. <laughs> uh, and and I, I always kept this. I came to Australia through the big um, search of demand of SAP talent pre Y2K. Um, I joined Deloitte Consulting at the time, uh, spent um, a number of years with them um, before some event changed the landscape of the big aids following the, the collapse of Anderson and, uh, and the Enron scandal. Uh, then joined SAP themselves, and I built the SAP business consulting practice in Australia and New Zealand, working with John Lombard and Geraldine McBride. Uh, and after that, took um, um, three, four years sabbatical, and then joined Capgemini, um, which I was uh, last before joining my, my current company. Okay. That's when we got to know each other, wasn't it, during your Capgemini days? That's yeah. right, yes. Very impressive, Pierre, very impressive. <laughs> Um, and so, what keeps me what keeps me with SAP? It's uh, I think it's been an in an amazing journey that SAP had in helping organization uh, along all those years, and they're just about to celebrate 50 years their 50 years anniversary, and still being relevant to a, a very large proportion of businesses across the world, and accompany them in their in in their ongoing transformation. They they take different names, but. Uh, um, the, the pandemic that we are just coming out of, touching wood, um, has created new requirements and, and things are changing all the time. And, and SAP is really has been part of this journey alongside many other technology players to basically adjust to the different requirements and keep supporting organizations. So it's been a key tool uh, to drive business transformation, drive change, and basically expose what technology allow organization to achieve so that's i think that's that's been a great place to be what we often find with sap is people that are working within sap big fans of it love it think that it's great and it's only going to go and get bigger and bigger and more businesses are going to implement it and then with s4 and all that kind of stuff whereas people who are outside of sap go no sap is dying that's it you know we've got to move to dynamics now or something like that but i think there's a real loyalty for people within the sap space and it's interesting to hear your career and how it's grown and how much you love it really and i think it's probably due to the fact that it is a very um tight community and and you bump into people in that community, in, you know, every place is in the world and, and you find someone that you know from somewhere. And I think that probably helps also uh, to keep people in that community because it's a very supportive community. The relationship you build during your career will serve you one day, uh, maybe not when you expect um, uh, them to uh, to uh, take place. And, uh, they, um, and, and I think that's what keeps people in that ecosystem as well. Mm. So what I'm interested in is you don't meet many people in SAP with your background in nuclear chemistry. And I'm wondering, how is that skill set and that background that you've got, do you think, differentiate you? You must meet a lot of program managers, program directors, senior people delivering SAP projects. But how is your skill set, kind of that background that you've got in nuclear chemistry, do you think it helped you in your SAP career? Because it's very unusual to find somebody from your background. Yeah, that's true, and I think we need to reflect in in saying there is the um, there is the skills that you have, and then there is the fields of knowledge that you've built over time. Uh, and as you grow in your career, I often, when I coach people, say uh, you basically grow in your career based on the contribution that you make. And this contribution is either to be a leader first of a team of two or three as, as a team leader on a project, then a team of 10 or 20, then a practice manager, a team of 50 to 100, and then you grow into more senior leadership role and you lead a thousand or 10,000 people. So that's basically the, the main 
the main career path. And as you follow that path, you need to acquire different skills and including the skills of managing people, um, the, the leadership skills to uh, to engage, uh, to uh, to motivate people, to show the path, uh, to show the art of um, what is possible even if it's uh, if it's setting high challenges. Uh, you have other paths as well, the one of high expertise where you become um, the worldwide expert of a particular topic, and you're the only person that that can achieve that. Uh, you can also be a um, a high performer of your own, a sole contributor if you're a top salesman, for example, and you manage to land incredible deals that still require a lot of teamwork. So I have to say, my my training in nuclear engineering probably what serves me the most is the scientific um, discipline and uh, and rigor that I acquired during my studies, which you can apply to many different fields, uh, whether it's communication, whether it's problem solving, um, and and uh, whether it's uh, it's strategy development uh, to have this this level of rigor. So that's probably where it served me the most. But I guess it's not specific to uh, to the nuclear engineering field. That's just one field where I. I sort of grew and built those skills as you would have in many other scientific fields. OK, all right, we'll focus on SAP now again. So what are your top three imperatives that you look for within your team when you're delivering a project or growing your team or delivering something globally? Yeah, I think to deliver uh, high quality outcomes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the first thing is you need to have pride in what you deliver. There have to be a sense of what I want to deliver is of great quality. Uh, I do really my super best in, in what I do in the time that was given. Uh, that's 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 essential. I think the second quality is to have a great understanding of the scope and the expectations. I think very often you see variation. It's really important to always um, make sure that you're centered on what is actually expected. And I think the last one is to have the ability to listen. So don't come um, to a project with a preconceived ideas of what the deliverable will be because you've done that before, but try to understand the real problem of that uh, that people are trying to solve. Usually, customers are trying to solve in their industry, and they're not always formulated in a very obvious way. They're not always exposed unless you try to find what it is. And I think that's the beauty of the role of a consultant, which is to to try to find this. Um, this this problem, you know, the core of the issue that has to be solved, and then to apply some creativity to find a way to solve that within the frame of the project in which you operate. And I think that's what really creates outstanding outcomes. Um, um, if you have these three skills, there is probably a bit more. Maybe if I, if you allow me to mention one more, it's just it's the right. accountability. So, <laughs> it's the, uh, the the pride for quality is one thing, but the accountability is essential. And mm -hmm. always have a sense of what is required to finish the task and to be on top of this, so that you know what you've done, but you also understand what's left to complete because other people are depending on what uh, what you do. Like a one size doesn't fit all, right? No, you can certainly learn and, and apply and, and you can just realize what you've done in the past to reapply it. But I think there is always an element of discovery, being humble in say you don't know all the answers. You really have to listen and find out what is different in this context. Yeah. One of, one of the questions, Pierre, we ask a lot of program managers, project directors as part of our kind of filtering process is, you know, define what a successful SAP project is for you. And we, we get a wide variety of answers. It's interesting, you know, some people it's delivering on time and budget, others it might be just putting it in and getting it working, um, a, a happy customer, whatever it might be. But could you define what a successful SAP program is for you in your mind? And how has your, your view of that evolved over the years? Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that that's a good question, and I can see why there would be many ways of defining this. I would say, from my perspective, a project is successful if it 
if it fills the expectations of the person that you're delivering this to. And I think it is essential because there is a vast degree of maturity in uh, in in the customer's expectations, in what they want from this project, in what they expect. And so for me, a successful project is when you deliver something that exceeds the customer expectation in the first place, that it does more than what they thought would be possible uh, in the time frame that you had. So that's a successful project. And it's, it is dependent on the level of maturity of the customer. And in terms of what has changed and evolved over the years, I think in, in a lot of SAP projects, one of the challenge has been to find the good compromise between um, uh, satisfying the customer expectation and they, uh, they, all their all their single desires and and maintaining a solution that is not too customized. And I think over the time, the customers have learned that minimizing customizing uh, in SAP and trying to adopt a more standard version of the software has longer, you know, has long term benefits, which they probably knew in when I started to implement SAP, but found more difficult to uh, to apply because they hadn't had the chance to see over the years what it means to have a super highly customized solution. Okay, sounds good. So what's your project, ma I'll start again, sorry. What's your project management methodology and how can you define it? Um, look, project management is a fairly well um, defined field with, with uh, you know, recognized best practices with a number of, uh, of streams, whether it's scope management, quality management with the deliverables, whether it's issue and risk management. Um, I think if I had to highlight two key elements, I think for me, um, the the success of of managing a project um, uh, an SAP project first starts by understanding the effort required and the scope and managing the estimate to completion. I think that's really something that is key. Being able at any point in time to understand where you stand and what's left and and see what are the areas at risk so that you can act on time uh, before it's too late to react to this. I think the second area, and it is particularly true in SAP projects, is making sure that the whole team understand the solution. So there is a need to have sort of a global architecture, global end-to-end -end process view, where people understand the dependency of what they do with what other teams are doing. SAP projects tend to have teams that are fairly fragmented, and creating this big picture where people do understand the, the 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 bigger game and the the dependency with other teams, I think is quite important so that they don't work just on their silo, but they work for each other and they understand the impacts they have on on other teams. Okay, definitely, I'd agree with that. Um, Pierre, again, this is another question we we throw at people during the kind of the vetting process, and it can be described as quite a negative question because it's about your biggest failure and your learnings. Um, from that, but I think it's really important um, for people, kind of for that SAP community, for people to learn from each other's failures. So, so by sharing that, it's, it's a great way of, of passing on that insight. So in your mind, looking at your career, what would be your biggest um, failure? And then what were the learnings and insights from that that you can share with the SAP community? Yep, look, I wish I had to say, no, don't have any. Everything was fine, but we have, uh, had somebody, but, we have had somebody before say, no, I've had no failures. And this was like a 25 year yeah. uh, project as uh, SAP project manager. Yeah. And uh, alarm bells rang. So, yeah, I think yeah. everybody has failures done there in some way. Yeah, look, I think it's uh, the, the one I can think of is, is an instance where um, there was some gut feel signals that something was wrong uh, and uh, there was the convenience to say, look, there are many people that are looking after that team. There is a team lead and there is an overall functional architect. Um, these things will be sorted out later. We tried to put some caveat around what had been done in one phase and say, let's not worry about this now and we'll just fix that in the subsequent phases. Uh, I think the lesson is there and it's very simple. If you have quality issues, the longer you wait to fix them, the more costly it's going to be. And so 
if there are quality issues, you need to stop, you need to revisit them, even if you have to throw to the bin and start from the beginning. Um, it is always the right solution and the right decision to do it right when you have this sort of a, a first signal, first alarm bells that ring, rather than leaving it for too long. And uh, that was a costly mistake. And uh, I, I certainly um, make sure that uh, it never happened again. And so when there is something that sounds wrong, then you have to dig in and just look at it and stop everything. Uh, work hard if you have to take the weekend, bring the team, but say we need to fix that because that's going to hurt much more if we let, if we let that go. Okay. So Thanks listen to your gut, you're saying, right? Listen to the gut, and if something doesn't seem right, then take the time to investigate and to look at it. And if it's really wrong, then just fix it. Don't think that it's something that you can push for later. I think you that's have to take the same a across straight a lot away. Of industries as well, though, right? It's the same in recruitment too. If you don't listen to your gut, sometimes you can be really stunned. So. Yeah, we're we're taught by HR professionals when you're asking commonly based questions. If you're getting the right answers, you move forward. However. We've got obviously millions of sensors in our gut that's telling us something's not right. And I was talking about this this morning, actually. Your gut's telling you something's not right, but you can't actually put it into words what it is because maybe yeah. the, the word doesn't exist, but there's something telling you that there's something not right. And I like what you're seeing there around kind of exploring it and understanding um, and, and working hard and doing a deep dive to find out exactly what it is, get it understood and corrected. That's good. Good advice. Um, Here's a good one for you. Who's been the biggest influence on your career and what did they teach you or do for you? What was the kind of the impact they had on you? I I would have to say probably the biggest influence was, was at the beginning of my career. Um, uh, in particular, two partners that I worked with very closely when I was with Anderson Consulting. And they they taught me the importance of um, of staying true to what's important to customers and to be honest with what is promised to them and, and to deliver what you said you would do, regardless of the cost and the difficulty of getting there, because that's that's the commitment, that's that's the, that's how you build the trust. Um, and it's often through difficulty, not through easy projects that you build that trust. And uh, along with that lesson comes the uh, the, the art of managing these customer expectations. And sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes customer um, try to push you and, and, and to stretch the boundaries and, and you need to find a way to handle that. Um, they are customers, so you need to treat them with respect, but sometimes you need to know also when it's the right time to push back and, and go back to the scope. So I think that was really important for me. That's something that I didn't really learn um, during my studies or I hadn't been exposed to, and that's something that I really kept with me all along my career. Mm. Yeah, nuclear engineering probably doesn't teach you how to deal with a difficult stakeholder. Eh? <laughs> no, it, the program works or it doesn't. The technology works or it doesn't, but uh, it's pretty black and white. So, uh, I agree. So, thinking back to when you were doing your studies and you were the security guard, um, what would you tell your 21 year old self? Um, yeah, it's funny when I uh, when I think about my 21 year old self, I also think about my children and and what I would tell them. Uh, I think the I would tell with the benefit of insight, um, never be afraid. Um, if you don't know how things will play out and if there is an opportunity to do something new, um, even if you don't have the answers grab it. This is where you learn. This is what creates the most exciting career opportunities. Uh, it's not going to work all the time, but trying to solve new problems is way more exciting than uh, than just uh, operating in, in a well-known environment where all the answers are already there and you just repeat what's been invented by someone else. It's much more fun to try to bring answers yourself on a new problem. So just grab those. Is it Richard Branson that says say yes and figure out how to do it later? Something like that, isn't it? Branson or Bill Gates, somebody like that, isn't it? One of the Bs, yeah. yeah definitely. <laughs> I, I, I'll take both. I think that sounds that sounds good to me. Yeah, exactly. Um, so who would you like to see on the podcast next? Um, there is one person in particular that came to my mind um, in terms of someone I would like to see and share 
their journey, their experience, but also their beliefs and their passion. Um, and uh, one of them is uh, Peter Chapman. Um, he's a great um, he's a great person in the SAP ecosystem and and has a great sense of innovation uh, and uh, great passion for technology. And I think that would be something that would be inspiring, I believe, for many listeners. Um, and there is another person that I I learned a great deal working together with um, is still at SAP, Simon Chiemlewski. Uh, and I think what I love about his approach to work is the, the high degree of uh, humility he has, um, despite being uh, immensely knowledgeable in, in what he does. And I think that's that, that's two good examples of people I think that uh, um, the, the community would love to hear from. Definitely. Peter's a real technical guy, eh? He's a real technical guy. He, uh, I, I mean, one of the high memory I have with him is that he went for a competition for SAP at the launch of HANA, uh, before S4 HANA, uh, to try to find case studies on how the HANA database would actually be a game changer. And he, he built this uh, proof of concept of detective HANA, uh, and he did just an awesome job. And it was such a great reflection of how you can be creative with technology and find ways to apply that to a real case, um, you know, a real case live situation. Um, that was that was a pleasure to to work with Bill and his approach to innovation and technology in the SAP space. I think is very inspiring. It's always good when someone's requested, so leave it with us, and we'll see them on the podcast soon enough. I'll be looking for that. Yeah, <laughs> we'll send it your way. Well, thank you very much. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, thank you very much for having me on the program. I think it's a great initiative. Please keep doing this. Uh, I think it, it keeps this community uh, interesting. It keeps discovering uh, aspects and facets of people that uh, you probably didn't know before. Uh, and so keep up the great work. It's uh, I think it, it's a great idea. Keep it up. Thanks very much. Thanks, we will. Yeah.